December 2017, Emerson Manangagwa is sworn in as Zimbabwe's new president following a military coup that ousted long-time ruler Robert Mugabe. At his inauguration, Mnangagwa promised a raft of reforms. He calls his new government a new dispensation. It is with a deep sense of gratitude and humility that I stand here today to address you fellow Zimbabweans upon my inauguration as President of the Republic of Zimbabwe having been mandated to form the next government following the outcome of the just-ended national plebiscite. We gather here yet again, as we did last year, with many similar guests. This, however, is a different Zimbabwe the dawn of the Second Republic of our Zimbabwe. In acknowledging the honor you have bestowed upon me, I recognize that the urgent tasks that beckon will not be accomplished through speeches. I must hit the ground running. We all need to summon and unleash in consent towards taking this great nation beyond where our immediate past president left it. For close to two decades, this country went through many developments. Whilst we cannot change the past, there is a lot we can do in the present and the future to give our nation a different positive direction. However, events that follow prove otherwise. It was immediately apparent that Zimbabwe was in a worse off situation. The end of the military, which had engineered the coup, remained visible throughout the run up to general election due on July 31, 2018. The militarization of key government and independent institutions, including the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission, accelerated. The playing field remained largely titled in favor of the ruling party, ZANU-PF. The hope of a free, fair and credible election remained dim. Zimbabwe was once again headed towards a predetermined outcome in favor of the incumbent. On 30 July 2018, Zimbabweans went to the polls. By the 1st of August 2018, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission was yet to release results of the presidential election. <laughs> Why can't they take it? Do or die. Do or die. 
kufa ukuba kwa kwa wasinga nyari kwa wasinga nyari kana ikurika kwa kwa wasinga nyari nyika iri kuparara vari kuramba chimba mavhotsi for which purpose for which purpose for which purpose what i mean Five years. Since I graduated, five years, no job. Five, five years, years, no job. Two thousand, five years. 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 Zimbabweans so were anxious. So, on the morning of August 1, hundreds of Zimbabweans began marching in the capital, Harare city center. They were demanding that the electoral body immediately release the results of the presidential election. Mnangagwa, who still had the reins of power, responded by deploying soldiers to gun down the protesters. At least six unarmed civilians died. Over 200 people are injured and treated for gunshot wounds. Four years later, we trekked down to Domboshawa, where we meet Miss Kumire, whose husband Ishmael, was killed by soldiers on August 1, 2018. She recalls the events of the day. But <laughs> Miss Kumire is not alone. We went to Arcadia in Harare, where we met Alison Charles, sister to Gavin Dean Charles, also shot in Harare on August 1, 
I said to me, ah, no, I'm, I'm going into town because I need to get my meds and don't worry about me, I'm safe, I'll be safe, I'll keep away from yeah. everything. And uh, we spoke for about 10 minutes on the phone, it's like I, I knew that something was going to happen. And I put the phone down on him and after speaking to him, he said he was going into town, so we heard that they were shooting in town. And I kept on trying to phone him, but his phone was not. His phone was ringing, and nobody was picking it up. So I began to cry, and I was at work, and my boss said to me, "You people better go home because there's been shootings in town." So I ran home, and when I got to my gate, because I had Wi-Fi. My messages started coming through on my WhatsApp. And I saw his picture laying when I knew he was gone. So that's how I found out he was dead. Because I saw social media when I got home. And um, the doctor from public service, because they had picked up picked him up on the road, yeah. said to me, we have your brother here, he phoned me about an hour later to say, we have your brother here, he can't talk, but he's okay, we just need you to come here to the medical center, but I knew he was born, I was already so distraught, because I had seen the pictures. Yes, I also need to ask you, T-shirt on my brother's stomach, and he didn't realize that the exit wound was the one that needed to be stopped. So he could have saved him, but he didn't know what to do because he was in a crisis at the mo at the time. So my brother bled out in his, in his arms, and he says that it was a policeman that was guarding the Court Street Zanu PF headquarters. shot my brother. That's what I, I, I read on his blog. Yeah. So, is there anything that has been said in terms of compensation? Well, we all know that the Mutanti Commission was there and they decided that the families needed to be compensated for the people that were killed and wounded. But uh, it's now four years we've been gone. And we haven't had an answer, we haven't had no communication from government. He left a daughter that was in grade four. She's now in form two. Nothing, no word, no father. She still cries knowing that she doesn't have a dad anymore. She's doing so well in school. She just wishes her father was here to see her progress. And nobody's just coming forward to say anything. When I found him, the day he was shot, they said to us, his body's been taken. We went to Fourth Street and we got them. They said his body's already been taken to Renato, mortuary. And we went there and when I found him, he had been picked up like roadkill and thrown head down, face down into a metal coffin, back of a police B-1600. 
that is something that I have to remember for the rest of my life. That is something that I don't wish anybody would have to see. I still can't I still can't talk about without feeling sad because of the way he lived. No goodbyes, no life murdered on the streets. I recognized him from his sandals and his dreadlocks. And the clothes he was wearing. That's how I recognized him because I couldn't see his face, it was down. Now it's going to be four years and nothing, nothing, just zero quiet. It's just been so silent. These are the forgotten people. Even the family, they would only appreciate it. Even the president himself said something about us to us. If he came and he apologized for what happened, because somebody gave the orders. And he is on the top, he is chief of the military. So who gave the orders? Maybe he can explain to us and tell us what happened on the day we lost our brother. On the day he was so cruelly taken from us. That's all we want is answers. We have closure. So while Mnangagwa responded to the killings by instituting a commission of inquiry led by former South African President Halema Mohlande, this has largely been a smokescreen. I must say, for the record, my hands are clean. <laughs> my conscience is very clear. My resolve is unbreakable, and my heart is pure. These hands you see have not spilled blood. Amen. These are clean hands. The mouth you see here has never conspired to have a life that is lost on the basis of political violence. I've said that violence is not part of our DNA. This is because all the recommendations made by the Commission are yet to be implemented four years later. Victims and their families are yet to receive compensation, let alone an apology. The police have remained partisan and has not gone through the recommended orientation to end of public gatherings. In fact, in January 2019, Police and the military went on to kill 11 people 
following a week-long shutdown protest against Prozac's. Over the past years, the police have been implicated in extrajudicial killings. Zimbabweans have been robbed of the right to demonstrate and petition. And as the country faces another election in a year, it is clear that Zimbabwe's democratic space narrowed. It remains a responsibility for all pro-democratic and pro-justice forces to join hands to advocate for a return to democracy, good governance, and respect for human rights as enshrined in the Constitution. Not only does the Mnangawa government need to bring closure to victims of August 1, 2018, and all the phases in an instance of violence against the citizens, it also needs to ensure there is none reoccurrence of such.